Greetings. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Antonio Butts. I'm the Executive Director of Walnut Way Conservation Corporation. Thank you for joining us today to learn more about our Data Dream Project in partnership with the Northwestern Mutual Data Science Institute, Marquette University, and UW-Milwaukee. A little bit about Walnut Way. We're a resident-led neighborhood community-based organization on the near north side of Milwaukee in the Lindsay Heights neighborhood. We operate about two miles from the heart of downtown Milwaukee. Our organization was founded on a dream to create a more cohesive and thriving community. Walnut Way itself, we're rooted in home and place. The Walnut Way Center, where we advance our operations, was formerly an abandoned property that almost 20 years ago now, we revitalized into the community center that neighbors participate in for revitalization efforts. The work we do focuses on empowering residents by creating spaces for resident leadership, civic engagement, environmental stewardship, and creating wealth building opportunities. The presentation you will hear today supports this dream through data science and looking at the heart of how people live in Lindsay Heights. A little bit about how we got here. In 2019, we applied for was with Data You Could Use, a local nonprofit research organization. We wanted a deeper understanding of the housing market in Lindsay Heights. We wanted to have a fair assessment of what's happening, what the trends are in the neighborhood. We also wanted to find ways to increase and sustain home ownership in the neighborhood by also providing training, mentorship, and financial incentives. We also wanted up-to-date research to share with residents, funders, and city planning groups that demonstrate and reveal the challenges and successes of the neighborhood. The grant allowed us to work directly with Northwestern Mutual Data Science Institute and students from Marquette and UWM who conducted the research and they also created visualizations of the data that will be shared with you today. So a little bit of housekeeping. All of the question and answer portion will happen at the end of the presentation. So please note, if you have questions and you're on Zoom, use the Q&A section of the platform to enter your questions. And if you're on Facebook Live, Go ahead and use the comment section. All right, we're about to get started. First, I'd like to introduce Mark Zakar, Data Science Talent Ecosystem Project Management Lead from Northwestern Mutual Data Science Institute, who led the project with the students. Take it away, Mark. Thank you. Thanks, Antonio. It's really a pleasure to be here with you this afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. This is Mark from the Northwestern Mutual Data Science Institute. The NMDSI, as Antonio said, is a partnership with UW-Milwaukee and Marquette University. The NMDSI has three broad objectives on research, talent, and community. This Walnut Way project cuts across all three of these objectives. Over the last four months of work, we've conducted research using publicly available data. We did this in response to the community need. And through that process, we were providing professional development for the eight talented data scientist students that you'll hear from today. As Antonio said, the project was launched last October in a collaboration with the organization Data You Can Use at their annual Data Day event. The NMDSI committed to Walnut Way data science expertise to address a data problem that they had. This was their quote, data dream. Next slide, please. Walnut Way came to data you can use in NMDSI asking these three large research questions that you see on the screen. Taking these NMDSI through our university partnership with UWM and Marquette formed a team of eight students to tackle this work. Over the course of the last four months, the team narrowed and reformulated the research questions so that we could answer them with the publicly available data that we had at hand and provide Walnut Way multiple living web-based data tools 
so that they can better access this public data and answer future questions that they have. We'll spend the next 30 minutes hearing from the five focus subgroups that were formed around the questions of rental affordability, property value and conditions, homeownership, and crime and school measures. Please note as you listen to these five groups present that they all worked with the same data. All the, the data came from these public available sources like the Milwaukee Open Data Portal and the Census Bureau, just to name a few, but they were prepared and analyzed differently depending on the question that the, that the particular subgroup was addressing. So you'll notice that sometimes the geographical granularity was different. Some were by zip, some were by census tract, others by parcel. Some of the studies were over time, over a few months, or broad multi, multiple year historical range. And some had just a single point in time measure. So without further ado, next slide please. I'd like to introduce you to my teammate Rajasi, who will present her findings on rental affordability. Take it away, Rajasi. Thank you so much, Mark. Hello all, my name is Rajasi Tamne. I'm a UWM graduate. Today, I'm going to share a few insights about rental affordability of Lindsay Heights. The analysis is based on data ranging from years 2012 to 2018. For rental data, I used Zillow.com, which is an online rental database. And Mark has already told about the other data sources I used. Next slide, please. Let's see the key takeaways from the data what I analyzed. Cost of renting. The cost of renting has been increasing since past few years. Here, I have taken uh, data from 2012 to 2018 for analysis and found that rent in 53205 increased by 17.5% and 53206 increased by 11.1%. Population. There has been decline in population. The population here, we are talking about the ages 16 and above, and it has been in decreasing year over year. Coming to an unemployment. It's uh, good to know that unemployment rate has decreased year over year, which is a very good sign. Coming to income, approximately there is about 2% of increase in income since 2012. Rental affordability. So spending around 30% of our income is the golden rule when we are trying to figure out how much we can afford to pay as rent. So coming to Lindsay Height residents have been paying uh, more rent than they can afford. That is 30% of their income goes towards rent, more than 30% of their income. Next slide, please. In this map, you can see that uh, you can see that the, the location of Lindsay Heights. So Lindsay Heights falls in two zip codes, that is 53205 and 53206. Next slides, please. While uh, deriving my insights, I tried to compare Lindsay Heights to another similar community to see the differences. The zip code I picked for comparative analysis is 53216 which is adjacent to Lindsay Heights. Here, pink and purple areas are the zip codes in which Lindsay Heights is located. And the green area is 53216. All the graphs that I'll be showing have the same color code. That is pink is for 53205, purple is for 53206, and green is for 53216. Next slide, please. So coming to unemployment rate. It's a good news that it has been declining, especially if you see in 53206, there has been a significant drop in unemployment. Comparing it with 53216, the unemployment there has been going down as well. So here in the graph, you can see the unemployment has been decreasing year over year for uh, all the three zip codes. Next slide, please. So coming to population, that is ages uh, 16 and above, uh, the population over years has been decreasing consistently in 53206. So if you see, uh, there is uh, the purple line shows how the population has been decreasing in 53206. So coming to 53205, it remains more or less similar. But in 53216, the year over year population has been increasing. If we concentrate on 53205 and 53206, the uh, the population has been decreasing. It's going down year to year over year. Uh, next slide, please. Coming to the rental occupancy. 
So people living in rental units in sim is similar from 2012 to 2018 in 53205. Whereas it has declined quite a lot in 53205 from 2013. So if you can notice that the purple line, uh, uh, it has been decreasing from 2013 to 2018. It was about 19,000 people in 2013. And coming to 2018, it has become 15,000, approximately 15,000. So year over year, there has been a decline in rental occupancy. But while comparing it with this other zip code, that is 53216, there it has been increasing the people living in rental units have been increasing next slide please while analyzing the data i found that there is a disparity in median income between uh, lindsay heights that is 53205 and 53206 to 53216 the income in lindsay heights is less when it is compared the average income of 53205 being approximately $22,969 per year, 53206 is $22,676. On the other hand, if we see the income of 53216 is 34350 So if you see uh, the green line, which is, uh, which is 53216, you can see that there is a lot of disparity in the median incomes of these zip codes. Next slide, please. Coming to cost of uh, renting. So the rents have been going up year over year. This is for all the three communities. But the rental rates are more or less very similar. If you see the average rent of 53205 is $712. Average rent of 53206 is $726. And the average rent of 53216 is approximately $731. So if you see, there is not much of difference between the cost of renting. In fact, after 2018, we can see that 53205 has higher rents compared to 53216. Next slide, please. So coming to rental affordability. Here, the blue dotted line is the 30% income line. The income spent on rent is above 30% income line in 53205 and 53206. So if you see the pink and purple line here are above the 30% uh, income line. So uh, it's approximately 37%. So average is 37%. Whereas in 53216, we can see that the line is below 30%. So it's approximately uh, 25%. So overall, I would say that income in 53206 and 53205 is less when compared to 53216, but the rents are very similar. And residents of Lindsay Heights are paying more than 30% of their income for rents. With this statement, I conclude my analysis. Thank you. Thanks, Rajasi. So now we'll move on to the group that studied property values. And so we have uh, Taya, Ashvini, and Aaron presenting. So take it away. I think Aaron is first. Oh, well, I want to, before Aaron begins, sorry, Aaron, I want to remind people that we do have a live Q&A happening uh, and we'll answer the questions at the end of the presentation. So please, uh, attendees, encourage you to post your questions and we'll answer them at the end of the presentation. Thanks, Aaron. Awesome, thank you. Uh, so hi, my name is Aaron, and I'm a senior at Marquette University. Uh, our group focused on property information and property values, looking at how assessment values and tax data are represented in Lindsay Heights. So can we go to our first slide, please? These are our main takeaways from our research. Our focus was mostly on the usability and visualization of data through the power of a dashboard, allowing you to look at and wrangle with the data yourself. Um, we'll be going over each of these insights throughout our, our little presentation here. Next slide, please. For our, for our dashboard, to our dashboard. So this is a live look at our dashboard, so we can show off the interactiveness uh, of it. Uh, this is the dashboard that we created to effectively display the data. Our first page looks at the property values of parcels in Lindsay Heights. This is an interactive dashboard allowing you to customize the data you want to analyze. 
you can look at specific years since 2000 and hover over each parcel in the map to see a specific value. The matrix on the left allows you to look at further information for each property. Next page. Hi, my name is Ashvini. I'm also a senior at Marquette University. Um, for this page, we are specifically looking at sale price for property types. For this page, the data was obtained from public sources and then was parceled to fit the Lindsay height boundaries. You can see that in the number of sales for properties between 2002 to 2010, the property's sales have increased. And a little dip happened between 2011 through 2014. And then the sales decide to go back up um, after 2014. You can see in the earlier years that there was an increase in commercial land sales. And in the last recent years, there was an increase in residential land. Um, the, the chart shows the color coordinated um, values of properties being sold. This page specifically looks at the business property values and the, t the sale prices. Once again, this page was, um, the data was obtained from public data and then parceled and cleaned to center around Lindsay Heights. Most businesses in Lindsay Heights tend to be, be uh, tend to be retail or services. That's the R and the S in this um, pie chart. You can see that the total assessment value is evenly distributed between the, with a few outliers. Um, regardless of the property business type, all of the assessment values tend to be on the lower end compared to the higher end. The ma map is also very interactive with the uh, visualizations and the matrix. So you can see that. And then all of the slicers are also applicable for the same aspect. Hi everyone, I'm Tia. I'm also a senior at Marquette. Um, for the tax delinquency page, this page was created to see if there was a correlation between tax delinquencies and housing assessments, as well as to view the number of years a person is tax delinquent. The data represents 53205 and 53206 combined. Above the right chart are the slicers. This allows you to filter the data by the following categories listed. The top left graph shows the average housing assessments per year. From 2008 onward, housing assessment has decreased. Below is a map of Lindsay Heights showing the number of years someone has been tax delinquent by parcel ID. The top right shows tax delinquencies by year. As you can see, 2005 to 2013 had a drop in tax delinquencies. 2015 and 2015 16 do not show bars as the data is missing from those years. The last graph on the bottom right shows the average housing ass assessment per years of tax delinquencies. The averages of eight, nine, and 10 are based off of one to two properties. Looking closer at the data, you can see that if you had less than six years, your housing assessment increased. If you had more than six years, your housing assessment was consistent. Um, for the tax principle, the goal of this page was to see the tax delinquency in the area of Lindsay Heights throughout a map and matrix. On the top right is our filters and a blue box that tells us the total principles not paid for both 53205 and 53206. The map on the bottom left shows the average tax principle due on par by parcel ID for Lindsay Heights. On the right shows the zip code matrix that the tax principal do and the annual tax bill by zip code. I'll hand it back to Aaron to recap and show our insights. All right, so that covers the property information with our key insights shown. Hopefully, this makes data accessible and usable for you, the community, allowing you to make informed decisions to further the goals of Walnut Way and the Lindsay Heights neighborhood. Thank you. Now we're going to move on to our next presenter. 
Thanks, Ashwini, Taya, and Aaron. Now up next are Dan and Eric from Marquette who focused their study on homeownership using uh, a tool called LandGrid. Thanks, Mark. So I'm Eric Qualk. I'm a grad student at Marquette and I also work in the Digital Scholarship Lab, which is located in the Rainer Libraries. And we focused on uh, home ownership with my colleague, Dan Underwood. Um, first slide, please. So some of the key insights we have is that um, home ownership has decreased in the community since 2000. It's declined from 40% to 30%. Um, the city of Milwaukee is the largest landlord. They own over 140, over 436 properties in the focus area. And when we did a, um, a inflation adjusted analysis of um, assessed value prices from 1999 and tw to 2019, comparing it to 2019, we noticed that there was a um, clustering of uh, declines in property value in the Northwestern part of the neighborhood. And so I'll talk about the first three and then my colleague Dan will talk about the building violations and construction permits. And in that analysis, he discovered that the majority of violations are residential or garbage related and that construction permits have increased since 2018. And just a quick note about the data. So Mark mentioned that a lot of information came from MPROP. For the violations and the permits, we used the Department of Neighborhood Services land management system and also that in the comparison from um, 1999 to 2019, in some cases, we weren't able to match properties by tax key or address. So we had to remove 134 properties from the analysis. Um, next slide, please. So as Mark said, we used a tool called LandGrid to develop these maps. It's an online mapping tool. So we wanted to start first with landlords that weren't from the city. So there's seven landlords that own um, nine plus properties in the focus area. And we thought this was an interesting insight because it shows that the neighborhood hasn't kind of been overtaken by um, a lot of out of state or other types of landlords. Um, next slide, please. And then this is the map of the properties that the city of Milwaukee or Milwaukee Redevelopment Authority um, have ownership of. So we can see that in the kind of southeast corner of the community, there's the city of Milwaukee Redevelopment Authority owns um, a clustering down there, but there's also kind of a mix throughout the, uh, the community of these properties. Um, and we thought this was kind of an interesting insight since the city seems to own a lot of properties that there may be an opportunity to develop like a Zillow for Lindsay Heights where community members or um, investors or other people could kind of search for properties that are available through the city and kind of take a deeper dive as far as what's available in the, in the housing stock. Um, next slide, please. And then this is the map of the assessed price change from uh, 1999 and then in 2019. So as you can see that there's um, quite a significant number of clustering in the lower portion of the community that seems to have shown increased in assessed value. But in that Northwest quadrant, there seems to be a clustering of declines in property value or assessed property value. And that might be an area to look at further, especially um, using land grids survey tool that can you know, get out in the community and kind of get a deeper, deeper dive into um, that section of the, of the neighborhood. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Dan, to talk about violations and permits. Thanks. All right, uh, next slide, please. Hey, everybody, I'm Dan. I'm a sophomore in Marquette, and I'm gonna be talking about violations and permits. And so first, I wanna point out that this is about 66.7% of all the violations uh, registered by the Milwaukee City are uh, either garbage and or residential cases. So that could be anything that's left out or just violations simply. And uh, I wanted to point out that Lindsay Heights does not actually have that high of a concentration as far as uh, violations go. So that is definitely a positive to point out. And uh, since these are trash related, uh, another thing that I analyzed could be that it could be easier to clean these up if there's a simple fix that could go around. So that's a positive, definitely. Uh, next slide, please. So here uh, I am referencing back to Eric's map about the assessed uh, home value change. So I just wanted to point out a side-by-side -side comparison that uh, the Northwest concentration is definitely surrounded by high concentration of uh, violations. 
though it's not definitely inferred that those are related, but it could be a heavy factor. And uh, just pointing that out again, that, you know, that is a key takeaway that uh, the areas with no violations do seem to have a higher uh, home assessed value change. So that's a positive as well. Uh, next slide, please. And so finally, then this is the building permits. Although this may not be visually striking, it is definitely important uh, already because in the year 2018, there was only a total of 53 construction permits applied for, but already for the first three months of 2020, there's been 64. So that's a nice uh, increase and it could contribute to a nice uh, home value change. And uh, that's definitely something to look forward to. Thank you. Thanks, Eric and Dan. So now we'll go to uh, two specific uh, focus areas that the students um, studied, schools and crime. So we'll start with Bo, who will present about schools. Take it away, Bo. All right, thanks. Uh, hi, I'm Bo, a senior at UWM. And I did my research on the schools in Lindsay Heights, and I was able to find some interesting insights. Next slide, please. Uh, so my key insights surround elementary schools, multi college prep schools, ACT scores, graduation rates, and initial and vigilant enrollments. And I'll explain these insights throughout the presentation. Next slide, please. So there are 14 public elementary schools in Lindsay Heights. I compared these schools, third grade reading scores with Milwaukee public schools and public schools statewide. I found that two schools in Lindsay Heights were scoring higher than most schools in the state. These two schools were Milwaukee College Preparatory School, Lloyd Street and Milwaukee College Preparatory School, Lolo Grove North Campus. As you can see, these two schools usually perform better than state averages. Next slide, please. I gathered the ACT score for public high schools in Lindsay Heights, MPS, and statewide. As you can see, statewide ACT scores are around, average around 18, as MPS as a whole averages around 15, and Lindsay Heights averages around 12. These average scores are close in range, but hopefully the gap between them will start to decrease going forward. Next slide, please. I compared the graduation rates of the high schools in Lindsay Heights, MPS, and statewide. As you can see on the left, Lindsay Heights has an average graduation rate of 50%, MPS has an average graduation rate of 62%, and the statewide graduation rate is 88%. On the right graph, you can see how MPS and Lindsay Heights kind of uh, mimic each other. After both districts had their ups and downs, the graduation rates have both been on the rise. Since 2016, LMPS graduation rate has increased 9%, while Lindsay Heights has increased 8.25%. Next slide, please. Some interesting data I was able to find was initial and eventual, initial and eventual college enrollment. Just to clarify, initial enrollment is when a student attends college the following year after high school. Eventual enrollment is when a student attends college a year or more after high school. I chose North Division and Shalom, and Shalom High because they had the most up-to-date data compared to the other schools. Looking at the chart, you can see that initial enrollment isn't the highest, but the eventual enrollment is high and has been increasing over the past 10 years for both schools. Both high schools have seen a 22.7% increase in eventual enrollments. So most graduates from both high schools eventually pursue a skill or degree. Next slide, please. And most students in the area are residents of Lizzie Heights, which is shown on these two graphs. When the overall population in Lizzie Heights decreases, so does the student population. There was an enrollment spike in 2017, but this was due to the fact that three K-8 schools opened up in the area. So it's safe to say that Lizzie Heights is home for many children. And that concludes my research and analysis. Thanks, Bo. Uh, and last but not least, our fifth presentation is about the topic of crime, and Dahatri will present on that. So Dahatri, take it away. Thank you, Mark. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm a graduate student in UW-Milwaukee and doing my master's in financial analysis, uh, keep going to key insights. Every step of the way, I try to analyze and understand the outcome, logically move to deeper understanding of the data. Overall, crime rate reduced by 23.07% in Lindsay Heights, considered population when assessing crime rate as it is decreasing in the focus area, found no significant relationship between crime rate and housing prices. Next slide, please. Total recorded crimes are showing a downward trend when total crime compared to zips 53206 has greater number of crimes. 
assault offense showing downward trend in 53206. All other crimes are showing downward trend. Does 53206 really have more crime or does it have more population? Is it a fair comparison? So in next step, I, I normalize the data of total crime using population. Population data is reliably available between 2011 and 2018. So use the available data to normalize crime per 100 people. Next slide, please. 53205's total population is not significant over the years. 53206 total population showing steady decline. Total crime rate reduced by 23.07%. Crime rates by zip codes is now not significantly different. Is this a good, is this good or not? How does Lindsay Heights crime compare with Milwaukee County? Next slide, please. When compared Lindsay Heights crime with Milwaukee County, Lindsay Heights total crime rate is significantly higher compared to Milwaukee County and it is also showing the same declining trend as Milwaukee County. What types of crimes are contributing to the crime rate? So in the next step, I try to classify and categorize the data by type of crime rate in Lindsay Heights. Next slide, please. Assault Assault offense, theft, burglary, vehicle theft make up to nearly 70% of crime rate. 53205's assault offense rate is showing slight increase. Burglary and robbery rates are staying the same. Theft is growing down. 53206 assault offense rate is constant over the years. Burglary, robbery, and theft rates are showing declining trend. Is crime rate affecting the housing prices? In the next step, I collected the housing prices data to check if there are any correlation between crime rate and housing prices. Next slide, please. 53206 yearly assessed housing value showing a negative trend. 53205's yearly assessed housing value showing a slight increasing trend, mainly by the increase in 2018. When checked for correlations, there is no correlation between crime rate and housing prices in 53205 and 53206. Is crime rate affecting the housing prices for a particular price range? So in the next step, I extracted the data for properties assessed between 26,000 and 300,000. There are mostly condos, sing single family houses and uh, close to those kind of properties. Next slide, please. Even here, there is no correlation between crime rate and housing prices in this range. Can this be verified statistically? So I use the statistical software jump to verify. Next slide, please. There is no correlation between the crime rate and housing prices in Lindsay Heights. That, 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 that's, when, that's where I stop my questions to myself. Thank you. So, could talk a little bit about next steps. First, I'd like to thank all of the students. We're truly grateful for your time, energy, the effort put in on this project. This is really important. And we're gonna be able to arm Lindsay Heights residents, our key stakeholders and other partners in order to move this work along. So as far as next steps are concerned, uh, we'll continue our work with MDSI to prepare a final report and when that final report is complete, we're gonna share it with all publicly, online and otherwise. This also will inform the implementation of our housing and economic development plan that is currently being led by Lindsay Heights residents. And so within this plan, there are components for training, capital, mentoring and services to help sustain the current home ownership and also create new homeowners in the area. We're also gonna share this information in our and in the insights that we've learned with the city of Milwaukee to support the comprehensive planning effort that's taken place in the Lindsay Heights neighborhood and some of our neighboring uh, partner communities like Midtown and uh, Metcalf Park in Amani. <clears throat> so we want you all to stay informed and, and track and, and, and watch closely as this continues to unfold and that final report is produced. But now we're gonna move over into our Q&A session for, for the final part of our presentation. So I wanna turn it back over to you, Mark, and say thanks again. Sure, thanks Antonio, thanks for being a great partner along this process. Um, so there's been uh, quite a few questions uh, asked in the Q&A part of uh, Zoom. Uh, so we, I will try to address as many of those as possible, but uh, 
with the constraints of time, we might not get to all of those, but we'll be sure to answer them uh, when we prepare our final report. So we'll first go to the students and, uh, and ask uh, students, uh, and maybe just a couple of the eight of you can answer, uh, what were the most challenging parts of doing this data science work with publicly available data? So I think, uh, Dahantra, you said that uh, you would like to answer that question first about the challenging parts of doing this work over the last few months. So Dahantra, can you speak up? Yes, uh, uh, yes. Uh, there are lots of uh, different challenges that we faced uh, when we are uh, dealing with this, uh, uh, the whole project, uh, particularly with the crime and comparing crime with housing prices. I need to uh, cleanse the improp, da improp data uh, from the Milwaukee open data source and uh, major, major, the part, the, the difficult part that I faced is like, uh, th that's a big and huge data that we are dealing with uh, when it comes to improv. And uh, most of the columns were being shifted in different uh, rows and different columns, which, which they're not supposed to be there. So cleansing them, it, took me a lot of my uh, time and uh, I need, I have to use other tools like uh, Excel's uh, advanced Excel's like um, Mac running the macros and find if and then statements so that I can bring all the zip codes together and put it in one place. That's the most challenging part I faced in this project. Thank you. Thanks, Dahatri. And Aaron, I think you said you also would like to answer that question about what was a, a particular challenging part of doing this work. Yeah, yeah. Um, kind of just to reiterate what Dahatri was saying is uh, that was going to be like my original answer was about uh, the difficulties with data, but there were you know other challenging uh, aspects that I'll I can also talk about. Um, kind of specifically in terms of forming uh, form, uh, forming the question about what kind of data we're trying to answer. Um, we were, we've been working on this for the past four months, um, but a lot of the, the work, uh, the early work, uh, a couple months of it went into figuring out what exactly, what data do we, do we have access to and what kind of questions are we trying to answer? Um, and, and, and so it's, you know, a lot of data analysis is in terms of the cleaning and the, the fund models and things, but a very important part of it as well um, is, is figuring out what questions you're trying to answer so that you can narrow down the topic from some from a very big, vague, uh, kind of broad idea into something specific and tangible that we can work with. Thanks, Aaron. And uh, we'll have a question for Antonio before we get into some of the specifics. Antonio, uh, was there an insight that the students were able to provide that you didn't have before uh, or are you looking forward to using one of the particular dashboards or data, um, data visualizations in uh, a uh, near, imme near immediate uh, project? Yeah, there are, there are several key insights that, that I think that we'll be able to carry forward and also utilize the, the tools that, and the platforms that um, the students utilized and introduced us to along the way. I think the property tax information is is really critical in understanding that there are several homeowners with uh, multiple years of tax delinquency. And so that's part of the, potentially part of the erosion of existing home ownership. I think this was not necessarily something new, but in terms of um, just better understanding it, also understanding that the city of Milwaukee is the largest homeowner in the area. It also provides this opportunity for, for residents to to take a, a deeper look and examine some different approaches around creating more equity and ownership uh, for, for the neighborhood itself. And so in those two areas, I think with our current housing and economic development plan and, and you know, what we hope for in terms of implementation, those are two areas that I know that we'll be looking a lot closer at in partnership with the city of Milwaukee to explore some different type of solutions and incentivize, you know, the process of new home ownership and um, sustaining existing homeowners. Thanks, Antonio. So uh, looking at the, the questions and um, you can upvote them. And so I would do want to turn, go to Rajasi, the one of the first presenters. Uh, there was a couple questions specifically for Rajasi's 
presentation on uh, rental affordability. So Rajasi, if you could turn on your mic uh, and answer the question about whether, um, why you used averages versus median home um, or, um, uh, when analyzing income and uh, rental affordability. Uh, was there a decision okay. there about average and median? Okay, so uh, the data what I found was uh, uh, median income. So I had mean and medium. So I preferred median because I think that that gives better idea. So I took median income, and the average here I meant is from average of 2000 from 2012 to 2018. So that's what I mean by average. And uh, I think that was the question, right? Right. And then uh, where was that two percent? increase of income was that for one of the particular zip codes or overall uh, so i i uh, actually combined the data for 2003 uh, 205 and 206 and it was approximately two percent increase from 2012. okay and uh, the baseline uh, unemployment i think the baseline unemployment uh, i have unemployment rates uh, for 53205, uh, in 2012, it was 26%. And in 2018, it is 17.5%. And for uh, 53206, it was 31%. And in 2018, it is 17.3%. So that's why there is a decrease in un unemployment rate. And uh, baseline, that is for uh, statewide, uh, in 2012, it was 7%. 7 and in 2018, it is uh, 3% if I'm answering it. Yeah, thank you. While I have you on the line, Rajasi, can you take this question that might uh, uh, answer also some of the, for the other five groups? Um, how reproducible is this work? I know that you created uh, your own uh, Power BI dashboard that will hand off to yes. Antonio and to Walnut Way, um, uh, but will will uh, Antonio and Walnut Way be able to pull uh, um, new MPROP data into that dashboard and and then reproduce um, uh, new insights. Okay, so coming to my data, I actually did not use MPROP data. So most of my data was from Census and from Zillow. So I think one of the questions was also asked about, uh, did I use uh, uh, family and uh, everything separately, like individually or family? So Zillow actually gave me uh, for all homes. So the rental rates are for all homes. So in this dashboard, you can actually put all the data. And if you keep, uh, 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 keep, uh, adding data to the dashboard, then you will be able to visualize uh, income and uh, other uh, parameters. And uh, I think that will be very useful because if you keep on uh, adding data to it, it will be more intuitive and then uh, easily understandable. So yeah, that will be a great addition if uh, Antonio uses it. Yes. Thanks, Rajasi. So going back up to some of the questions that were asked, uh, there was a uh, question about, uh, which was next? Uh, to the students and whether this, working on this project um, changed uh, uh, your focus area of your degree that you're pursuing or what you might do for your career. Um, and so did, did the work uh, influence your career at all um, and the work that you're doing at your campus. So for me, this uh, this experience gave me a better understanding of uh, how to use uh, data uh, together in data science related. I'm I'm my I'm a master student in financial analysis. I'm not too far from the tree, but. Uh, the thing is, I, I thought of becoming a financial analyst. Uh, now my uh, course, um, my thought process diverted to completely to do the data scientist uh, related field. So I was like, uh, it was a good experience for me to use my economical and statistical knowledge uh, into, into doing the project. So this is a good experience for me. All right, we're going to go to uh, Bo. There was a question about the schools. Um, there, there is, there's these top performing schools uh, in Lindsay Heights, uh, but it seems disconnected with the, the actual graduation rates 
um, uh, especially since those were, are, I believe, MPS schools. And so, uh, Bo, do you have any comments about the, the disconnect between those couple top performing schools and the other schools in the neighborhood? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. So there are four Milwaukee College Prep schools in Milwaukee, and two of them are in a 5205 zip code. And for these LMC, LMCP schools, 96% uh, of their alumni who were with them for at least two years uh, finished high school on time. So I put that in our report, for one, because it's in Lindsay Heights, and two, just because it's like inspirational. And I feel like schools across Milwaukee can uh, take notes from uh, LMCP. Another cool thing about them too, like they both hold about like 500 students in enrollment, which is about 200 more than most schools in MPS. So that's why I put it in there, but that was a good question. Does somebody want to take the question about um, about the granularity of the data and the the trouble with the the data sets uh, for using uh, zip code based data sets and uh, parcel level data sets? Wondering if we can extract uh, neighborhood boundaries um, and use data that only corresponds with those neighborhood boundaries. And I think Aaron, you did quite a bit of work um, in, on GIS software uh, trying to figure out how to to create those boundaries and get the, the data to work the way you wanted. Aaron, can yeah, you take I, that question? Yeah, I can uh, talk a little bit about that. Um, it is definitely a very difficult question, especially when you're getting data from multiple sources. Uh, some data is rep you know, recorded by zip code, some of it's by neighborhood, by city, by census tract. All these different variable are these different sources. Um, and so it, Really, the only way to there. I mean, I guess there's a couple different ways, but um, it's really difficult to find an a, an accurate estimation of trying to standardize that. Um, and and so I some you know sometimes it's, it can be easier just to uh, just to as Rajasi did just to look at the zip code overall. Um, and I mean, fortunately, uh, in this case, uh, the zip codes that she looked at. Uh, there's not a lot, there's not huge variations between um, uh, the, the Lindsay Heights parts of the zip codes and the non-Lindsay Heights parts of the zip codes um, in terms of, of the data that we were looking at. And so looking as that, at that as a uh, kind of rough uh, estimation of, of what, uh, of the data for Lindsay Heights uh, can be good, um, they will get more issues when it's, you know, when you have a lot of um, variability inside, you know, if we're looking, if we don't want to look at data for like the entire state of Wisconsin, because a lot of things that are specific to Lindsay Heights are not very similar to the rest of Wisconsin. Um, and so it can, it, it can be definitely be really difficult uh, to try to standardize those things. And, you know, there are some statistical methods for how to, to try to, to estimate or to basically guess at what these lower um, more specific uh, data like parcels, uh, uh, what kind of data is in, is in there. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, Antonio, we're coming to you next. Um, so are there any implications to the results of that the homeownership research uh, indicates that Milwaukee or a uh, subsidiary is the major owner of properties in Lindsay Heights. Uh, is that something that you knew and how is that going to um, influence uh, the wall that we work in the future? Yeah, we were, we were aware of it generally that the city uh, owned a significant number of properties in the area, just in terms of really rolling out and being detailed and understanding which properties there, those were is what this research revealed. I think the implications are is that there's a lot of opportunity to do, you know, public-private partnership around incentivizing home ownership and stabilizing again existing home ownership. Um, what we have on the horizon, literally right now, in partnership with Leighton Boulevard West neighbors, is this opportunity to rehab some of those tax foreclosures in Lindsay Heights. And so this data 
as you can see in the presentation, revealed to us, you know, one of the areas where it really needs some attention, and, and that's on the, uh, the northwest side of Lindsay Heights, where um, compared to the rest of the neighborhood, it is uh, particularly you know, unstable, and there's a lot of tax foreclosures and a lot of other activity that we would, you know, potentially be able to address to bring it in line with the rest of the neighborhood. So, so absolutely, we, we see, you know, having this information as a, as a, a, a strong and viable tool for residents to use in conversation in partnership with the city of Milwaukee. We see this data as, a, as an efficient and, and productive way to target our, our, our effort and our resources around uh, revitalizing pockets of the neighborhood that haven't received as much attention as others over the years. So we will definitely be uh, using this data to, to, to drive the conversations and the next steps for, for the activities that we'll be uh, involved in this summer and going forward around housing. Antonio, we're gonna stay with you for one more and it's a question uh, that you and I um, went back and forth on quite a bit um, is that a lot of work has been done in the neighborhood over the last 15 to 20 years with different stakeholders uh, addressing quality of life or housing issues. And we struggled whether we, we could focus our, any uh, analysis around data that would track the impact of, of that work and what has changed because of that work. And we ended up uh, deciding to focus uh, the students' time and energy on uh, large publicly available data sets. And so Antonio, is there, how might um, the use of smaller data sets focused on a particular stakeholder's work be used in the future? I know that's something that you and I um, definitely wrestled with at the beginning of the, the launch of this project. Well, it's, it's a lot of variables to pick and choose from to, to try to decide whether there's some correlation or evidence for, for some sort of impetus, if you will. But when you look at the presentation, I think about the presentation that's been shared with us today, you know, some things that, that sort of shine, you know, right away are there, there's not a lot of code violations on properties in the neighborhood and that most of those violations were related to, to litter or, or trash. And then, so what that says potentially is that along with a couple other pieces of information that was shared today, is that the neighborhood is probably more stable than it appears to be in, in terms of just social cohesion. And what we have here is, is truly a lack of equity and a lack of ownership, which we know is typically correlated with pride and, and some real intentionality around sustaining the quality of an area of your own property, you know, so on and so forth. So I think that when we, when we think about the students and, and their ability to pull specific city uh, data, data points and put that data into these platforms and generate the visualizations, I think that being able to carry that forward, you know, in a more frequent basis will be very important and it, it'll, it'll basically feed into the strategy and planning of groups for, again, particular smaller areas. So this hyper-local approach to really understanding your data is, is really important. And to your point, Mark, this is where it all started for us. We wanted to own our data. So the same way as an analogy, um, we wanna be able, some of us have to check our heart our heart rate, our blood pressure more frequently. Some of us have to check our blood levels for diabetes. Well, in that same way as a neighborhood, as a community, we want to own our data. We want to understand um, the, the home ownership rates, the, the, the lack of home ownership, the things that are impeding that, and, and other variables that, that we can track on a continuous basis in order to inform decisions and how resources are deployed. So I think these opportunities to, to, to pull this data forward and look at it in a, in a very local way is really important process for neighborhoods that are, you know, traditionally or historically economically excluded as a way to, to bring 
data or facts to the table when having conversations with key stakeholders, partners, donors, investors about what the needs of the community really are and what things really need to be addressed so that, again, resources can be deployed in a real efficient, in an efficient way. Uh, thanks. We have about five minutes left, so I think we'll take either one or two questions, depending on how long the answer goes, and then uh, Ant Antonio and I will will wrap up. Um, so, to the groups that did that looked at property value, so I think um, that's Eric and Dan and uh, Aaron, Taya and Ashvini. Um, whether you could add in uh, into like a timeline large events like the Pfizer Forum construction, and whether large events like that influenced the property value and rent in the community. And so how difficult would it be to, to populate uh, a timeline with events like that and look for correlation there? So does somebody want, from one of the groups want to take that question? I mean, I, I could jump in and just like from from our from our work kind of looking at the the trends, we only took like those two time points. So yeah, I think you could definitely, you know, look at it year by year and then you could try to kind of factor in, you know, like somebody had asked, well, you know, they they just built Pfizer Forum. So how is that kind of impacting property value in the area? And then maybe see if there's a change, you know, between the years it was not there and then the years it was. Um, you know, but then like the old saying goes, you know, correlation is not causation. Um, so there might be other factors going on in the background that could be affecting that, that issue as well. Eric, while you're, you're on the phone, uh, we'll ask this last question. I know you uh, looked into this, Eric, with uh, attaining data from financial institutions that uh, provide lending in the area. And uh, what can you remind me uh, and the audience of what was the decision about getting that data and how difficult it would be to to get and then to use and what it would, might show us and whether it is available even um, to use at all? Oh, yeah, I think I, let me see. Um, yeah, so there's a, like a Home Mortgage Disclosure Act that we had looked into and it does provide like, um, I would say like anonymized data, I think it is. It's not like particular people and properties and things that'll say, you know, here's all the financial institutions that have given out mortgages or denied mortgages. And these are the reasons why. Um, and that, that that data set is out there. I think the, the thought process then was to kind of look more towards analyzing current home ownership and then kind of those assessed values at the two different time points from like, you know, 1999 to, to 2019, and then doing doing a look at that. But I think the the other data set is out there and is definitely something that could be could be worked on in the future. Thanks, Eric. Thanks for taking those last two questions. So, uh, and Antonio, I'll let you close us out. But I want to say thanks to the the eight students and for their really incredible hard work that they put into this project over the course of the semester. Some of you uh, received class credit, and this was part of a class. Others of you were doing this voluntarily, uh, just for the sake of your personal and professional development. So, I really thank you uh, for putting in a lot of sweat equity into the the data mining and the uh, the data science work. Uh, thank you very, very much. And I want to thank Walnut Way and Antonio in particular for sticking with us all through the process, meeting once or twice a week. Uh, it's been been a, a, uh, a lot of work and a lot of time, but, and hopefully you'll be able to use some of these, uh, these live tools um, uh, for your future uh, work. And if you want to know more, uh, please uh, follow and go to nmdsi.org um, for any particular questions uh, from the Northwestern Mutual Data Science Institute. Thank you, Mark. Uh, again, we're really grateful to be in partnership with Northwestern Mutual Data Science Institute. Thank you to Corey as well and the rest of the team and the professors at uh, UWM and Marquette and especially the students for all the time and effort you put in. Now, four months ago, we, wasn't, we weren't necessarily clear on, on where we were going when we got started, but because everybody was committed and consistent in meeting, 
we've been able to produce a product that will be of value to um, Walnut Way, to the neighborhood, and probably to the broader city in terms of how to move a project like this along going forward. To our stakeholders that are on the phone who are involved in actually moving this work, who actually do this work, a community building, this report will be available in the coming weeks and there will be an opportunity for us to, to reconvene around this, this information and make some decisions about our approaches for advancing forward with, with, this, with this knowledge. And so with that being said, I'd just like to thank everyone again for taking some time to, 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 to hear the presentation to spend time with us and the students and for providing your questions and giving us an opportunity to share. Um, if you have further comments, please email us at info at walnutway.org, info at walnutway.org, or check us out at our website, um, walnutway.org, www.walnutway.org. Or you can also, or if you want more information on the Northwestern Mutual Data Science Institute, that would be www.nmdsi.org. And you can always follow us on social media at Pound Walnut Way. Thank you, everyone. Have a great evening.